So our thinking is that if we are to start pursuing system transformation, the vehicle through which we are to do that would need to shift from project, meaning a very siloed, linear understanding of the world, towards something else. And portfolio is our hunch for a vehicle that is able to help us understand uh, the drivers as opposed to symptoms um, of the issue, um, a, a vehicle that can help us generate more options in tackling very complex issues and bringing together uh, uh, the resources, the partners, the expertise um, around some of the big questions. In a systemic logic, you look for a different path to scale, which is not funneling, but is actually layering over time. And the reason being is that there is not one single magic fix that is going to solve climate, poverty, etc. What you need to have is a process that allows you to expand options over time rather than reducing them to one that is going to be the one that scales by magic. And so you need to work differently in a portfolio logic to think about how, what is your path to scale, how you aggregate resources and learning over time coming not only from your organization, but from others. So that the level of options available to yourself, to your partners, to governments increases over time. You need to be able to work at different levels at the same time. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Boundaryless Conversations podcast. On this podcast, we meet with pioneers, with thinkers and doers, and we talk about the future of business models, organizations, markets, and society in this rapidly changing world. Today, uh, with me, there is my usual uh, co-host, uh, my colleague at Boundaryless, Shruti Prakash, who is joining from Jakarta. Hello, Shruti. Hello, everyone. We also have uh, two uh, that uh, I would describe as uh, uh, relentless explorers of innovation in the development space. We have Mili Begovic, who is uh, uh, heading strategic innovation at UNDP. Hello, Mili. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. We also have uh, Giulio Quaggiotto, that is uh, the former head of UNDP strategic innovation, uh, besides uh, being a research fellow at uh, uh, MIT and UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. Hello, Giulio. Nice to have you with us. Thank you for having me. So as loyal listeners know, on this podcast, we do not just uh, bury our heads in startups and corporate, but we rather look at uh, how broader systems are changing and we look beyond sectors. Uh, so I was thinking that uh, as a new provocation for our audience, we could think of uh, getting inspired by a community and, and a couple of people that uh, have already also Uh, personally, he also had the chance to work with uh, when uh, with Boundaries, we collaborated a little with UNDP. Uh, and so as I've been following uh, UNDP work in the last few years, I would say, uh, from an original transition towards more like ecosystemic approaches that started probably around 2017-18, if I remember well, your team uh, and you both, uh, Giulio in your previous role and, and now Milly and, and together, uh, you, both of you and with other countless uh, great people. You have been working a lot into transitioning from a traditional approach that is normally project-based into uh, what you call a portfolio approach to strategic innovation. Since this transition is happening in the business space as well, I thought that uh, this inspiration would have been beneficial for our community. And, uh, and so as a first um, framing moment, maybe I will leave it to you to um, introduce us to you know, the tenet, the key tenets of this transition, why, how, uh, and maybe the key challenges that you are seeing. Uh, okay, so um, Simone, thank you so much. And it's a nice way to start a conversation. So maybe I take, take us back to, um, uh, you know, th I would say the first decade of innovation in UNDP really kind of focused on bringing in different methods from outside the organization within the development in hope that those methods would be able to uh, create a space for change. So design thinking, crowdfunding, blockchain, all of these different uh, movements and methods that were sitting largely outside the organization. The premise was, how can we rapidly bring them in to UNDP with our partners, uh, prototype them on the ground in hope of creating those spaces for change? And this first phase, I would say, culminated with UNDP investing into the largest learning network of accelerator labs in the world under the assumption that with the fastest learning network, we would be able, we trade 
um, in learning as a currency in order to tackle um, SDG and the planetary issues. And this created quite a lot of energy. It, it, it created quite a lot of positioning. It helped attract very interesting organizations and profiles that probably before would not have been would not have considered UNDP uh, a partner to play with and work with. But at the same time, the feedback that we have been hearing from governments, from mayors, from our also offices on the ground is that maybe the pendulum have swung too far to one side, that we as an organization need to be ambidextrous, meaning we need to invest equal amount of effort and attention, not just in kind of moving fast and rapidly prototyping and experimenting at kind of an incremental side of things, but also to explore uh, what are the conditions for doing deep systemic change. What does that look like? And in that way, uh, it's not either or, it's an organization that's able to pull on different levers as the need arises. So when we started looking into that question, um, we kept being brought back to project as a vehicle through which we engage with partners and deliver, if you will, a support, a policy program a support. And it isn't just an instrument, right? A legal instrument that can be hacked one way or another. But we kept being brought back to the philosophy and the way of understanding the world that project really kind of encodes, which is an understanding that if we only have enough expertise and resources, we will be able to solve the issues. The sort of you know, belief that uh, the world is predictable and stable and we will be able to crack it only if we are able to bring together enough resources. And obviously the world that we live in kind of proves that that is not the case. So our thinking is that if we are to start pursuing system transformation, the vehicle through which we are to do that would need to shift from project, meaning a very siloed, linear understanding of the world towards something else. And portfolio is our hunch for a vehicle that is able to help us understand the drivers as opposed to symptoms um, of the issue, uh, a vehicle that can help us generate more options in tackling very complex issues and, and bringing together uh, the resources, the partners, the expertise um, around uh, some of the big questions that we have to deal with. And, and just today, as a plug, uh, we have some new research out that basically shows that out of half of 160 countries that we looked at, half of them, for every one percentage uh, point increase in GDP, corresponded with an average of 64,000 people per country falling into extreme poverty. One. Um, and the other one is that in 80% of poorest countries, the increase of GDP actually came with the increase in, uh, in, in carbon emissions. So the type of growth that we have is really not working. And what mm -hmm. we have as a response to that we have to invent. Uh, we don't know what is the adequate mix of responses that will help us evolve a very different type of well-being and value models uh, that we need to ensure well-being. From what uh, Mili is introducing, I get uh, this idea that uh, you have to be ambidextrous in terms of projects that are more like uh, experimentation-driven and uh, more like uh, probing the system on a you know, more contextual basis. And moving at the portfolio level allowed you to think more strategically and look into depth, uh, root causes, leverage points, uh, embrace this idea of optionality, so creating many pieces that can uh, approach a systemic problem from a more general perspective. Am I, am I getting it right? Yes, absolutely. And uh, I think there's at least two or three different things that in this, if you unpack what you just said, are implications of that, right? So one is a quest and search for coherence at different levels. So the first one is the coherence between the tools and the approaches that you bring and the nature of a problem that you're trying to solve. So again, as Milly said, project, the way the bureaucracy tends to understand it, is not coherent with a long-term structural challenge like climate change, poverty, etc. It also uh, tends to be an instrument that limits in the amount of organizations, financial resources that you can attract to solve that particular problem. Uh, so again, the challenge of how you organize a whole group of organizations around a common intent, right? The second thing is that it entails uh, this shift from project to portfolios, uh, also exploring a different path to scale, which I believe is a topic you covered uh, times before, right? So uh, in the uh, move fast, break things 
type of approach, you move into funneling logic, right? So you try many different things under the assumption that a lot of them will fail and one of them will be the right one and it's going to scale and become a unicorn. In a systemic logic, you look for a different path to scale, which is not funneling, but is actually layering over time. And the reason being is that there is not one single magic fix that is going to solve climate, poverty, etc. What you need to have is a process that allows you to expand options over time rather than reducing them to one that is going to be the one that scales by magic. And so you need to work differently in a portfolio logic to think about how, what is your path to scale, how you aggregate resources and learning over time coming not only from your organization but from others so that the level of options available to yourself, to your partners, to governments increases over time. And so what you don't want to have is, you know, what can artificial intelligence do for climate change type of solution. What you want to have is a series of options because it's a complex, difficult, often unpredictable issue. You need to be able to work at different levels at the same time. And the final thing, which is more organizational, I guess, but one of the things that I think we learned, Millie will correct me if she thinks otherwise, is that uh, organizationally, this requires a much deeper rewiring than having a, a space on the side interesting, maybe a lab or an experimentation space where you do lots of fast prototyping, right? This is needed. In fact, we need much more of it. But at the same time, if you really want to think through this question of coherence and move beyond projects, you need to really rethink completely not only the way you do your programs, but also your backend. So things like human resources, uh, the way you allocate financing, the way you actually organize your auditing even, right? So it's a very different way of operating that really challenges really the backbone of the organization. And that is really where often many of the biggest challenges are because you really start talking about very different way of doing things. It's really interesting how you use the word coherence because in our practice, we have been using coherence as a way to say, you know, you are an organization, but you want to present yourself to the market, for example, in a certain coherent way. So there is a trade-off between the autonomy you can grant to your organization and the coherence you can get as you present yourself into the market. But now that I'm hearing coherence from your uh, point of view, it feels like you may have a mission as an organization. And in the case of UNDP, it's systemic transition, right? And then uh, you may make mistakes in uh, identifying, uh, instead of with your mission, with clear outcomes that are more like project wise, right? More initiative wise. And so uh, the incoherence that can grow, it's between what you actually do and maybe measure and you feel good about uh, on a specific project basis and the coherence with your more systemic uh, mission that you have in mind. So that's a very interesting point. And you also said that there may be actually a conflict between uh, these two layers. You may have, uh, for example, Mili, you said growth drives poverty paradoxically, or growth drives carbon emissions, which is, again, another paradoxical, which it's, I mean, this is something we're going to probably get back on. Uh, uh, sometimes we also have conflicting SDGs, right? Another thing you said, you, you said, uh, rather than reducing options, which is something that we tend to do, in, in, for example, in startup culture, right? There is this idea of pivoting and, until you get tried. You seem to have to entertain uh, this idea of optionality but not just as options you bring and with the hope that maybe one option wins, but rather this capability to entertain a diversity of options. So uh, not with the aim of reducing them at some point, but rather with an incumbent need that you have to manage this complexity. Yeah, I think while, let's say, you're developing well-estimated and calculated optionality, right, essentially, I think this amount of diversity that's being brought in, how does all of this trickle down into the organization? I think, Julio, you mentioned on the points of maybe adapting your HR and finance services and things like that. So maybe to double down on that will be helpful for our listeners as well and trying to understand how you keep all of this open, give 
let's say freedom to the employees as well or participants and different stakeholders that will be good to understand okay so maybe we can start answering the question from this concept of coherence right because i think it plays out as simona said at a couple of different levels on the level of looking at whether we have sufficient amount of diversity and options among the resources and expertise what we're seeing is that in any particular country or region a UNDP team almost needs to seed a little bit of its own institutional uh, identity in order to align an ecosystem of partners around the bigger objective and and a bigger mission if you will i mean when i say undp team obviously undp teams in the country work with governments and for and on behalf of supporting the governments right so what this actually implies is or at least what what we see from the ground is that there are a number you know development banks private sector foundations civil society everybody is looking at an issue but from a particular slice and by going in parallel there is no opportunity to sort of compound one another to build on legacies and actually sequence and combine different expertise and resources so there is a need and simone this goes back a little bit to our work on platforms and function of platforms to create a space where different players see a value of actually coming and playing together off of the same infrastructure and then meeting others who they can work with and so on and so forth this requires enormous amount of time and effort um and again seeding or rather understanding institutional boundaries in the more porous way to be able to build that shared understanding as to where are we moving into one and two building an infrastructure where people can plug and play in an almost decentralized way and this is a bit of a challenge i would say for an organization like UNDP no different than it is a challenge for a government or a public sector organization which is a bureaucracy that works in a very kind of waterfall like organigrams if you will with very sort of clear this is inside the organization this is outside the organization so this is one level of coherence the other level of coherence i think is the internal side right so if we as an organization want to move into a portfolio way of working that means as julia pointed out looking at all of the different pieces and rules of the game and rules of engagement that we have so for example how do we understand risk the risk policy in itself has a number of compliance accountability audit uh, implications that if we take portfolios to heart meaning it's about emergence it's about admitting that we don't know that we need to jointly figure out what works what doesn't that requires a very different uh, way of making decisions between ourselves uh, and our partners so if i look at again this retrospective of the innovation in UNDP um in the first phase attracted people who were really interested into new and shiny and buzz and experimentation and labs and move fast and throw grenade into bureaucracy now a lot of our time is spent with parts of the house that we have not generally worked with or talked to and it also raises a question of capacities right uh, and and comfort because everybody comes at it from different perspectives and then we need to do the same thing internally that we're doing externally build a shared understanding as to where we're moving towards so um for us that coherence internally has meant looking at the big blocks of rules of engagement from hr to different policies to what is the funding structure look like what is the business model um and sort of seeing where are the uh, you know small changes that we can make to keep creating the space to show what this model works and i think it bears saying is that th- there is no proven model that we can point to and say here's an organization that has completely moved into portfolios 1 and 2 UNDP can change all at once but unless the broader development sector changes unless donor governments for example shift the thinking around what is it that we're crudely saying buying with development finance things don't move if governments themselves don't look at public funding um and start thinking about public funding from the perspective of buying outcomes as opposed to funding activities things don't move so i think that coherence plays on a number of different levels when we talk with companies and uh, they have these um, um outcomes that they have like normally they are revenue outcomes and we recently discussed with uh, teresa torres on the on the program and uh, she spoke about to get the organizational structure right you really need to get the outcomes right so that you can basically do um in what we call inverse conway maneuver 
so that you design your organization in a way that it produces a certain outcome. I'm wondering with what Millie just said, and I have some other follow-up questions, but especially the one on emergence. So it looks like there is much less clarity on the outcomes we want to generate. And so I guess that from an organizational standpoint, that's really challenging to understand how do you organize. This, again, is in some ways, maybe one of the words that will come up over and over again is identity. So imagine you have an organization where the identity of people is tied to a project that they do and an organization that, you know, like many development organizations still, its identity is one of a planner, which is, uh, for the reasons that Mille just said, offer under constraints to report in a very linear way its activities as opposed to necessarily its outcomes. Uh, for uh, reasons that are perfectly valid, which is transparency and accountability, right? So you need to account for every single penny that is spent, obviously. But this often comes into conflict with the logic of working with emergence and learning, which is really, you know, you can put the perfect five-year plan together when COVID happens and you need to scrap that and move to a very different place. Here lies the tension, really, that if you really want to say, well, yes, these are complex, systemic, structural issues, if these things come at you unexpectedly, then you need to design for that. And that really creates quite a lot of uh, discomfort, right? Because it challenges the identity of a planner. It challenges the relationship with your key partners. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that, for example, changes in this work is that rather than saying, you know, I'm coming to you with a beautiful report with everything is a success every six months, you are going to be co-owner of the risk and of opportunities in this portfolio, which means we want to have much more frequent conversation with you about what is emerging, both things that are unexpectedly positive and both things that are unexpectedly negative. So we can course correct jointly much more frequently and much more often. Now, this is very, very different role, for example, for someone who manages monitor and evaluation or someone who is even a project manager that needs to all of a sudden look, take a, a balcony view of what we're doing and start thinking in a much bigger picture. And yes, this creates the sole questions about how do you work with uncertainty, ambiguity, uh, emergence. It's a very different set of capabilities. So I'm sure Millie will talk about it. But for example, one of the things that we did is work and design programs for our management to look at how you actually work with uncertainty. And so whether it is alternative reality simulations of them shadowing a magician or a pilot or a surgeon to actually see what it looks like to operate in condition of improvisation, emergence, and unexpected things coming at you. This is all part of a rewiring and the developing of new capabilities. And specifically on the question you asked, Simone, around outcomes and outputs, etc., and how do you measure it? One of the things that we did is we set up a monitor and evaluation sandbox. So not only UNDP, but partners exploring and experimenting with different ways of thinking about outcomes, intermediary reporting, ongoing learning, ongoing adaptation, because this challenge of working with complex emergent issues requires a different way of thinking about these issues which less, again, again, about clear-cut outcomes and clear-cut definitions. I have a quick uh, follow-up question for you both, um, and uh, especially given the framing that you just kind of add, right, this idea of uh, having to deal with emergence instead of, as Mili said, uh, buying outcomes, which is something that doesn't really work. Uh, there is a lot of co-owning, so co-owning risk, co-owning strategy, co-owning this communication, practical elements like the communities of practice and, and lots of time and energy commitment. This is not something that gets handed over to someone else, but it's more like a collaborative process that needs to happen. And especially as Mili said, you know, I think the, the point on uh, the institutional gap, right? 
uh, when you alluded to, if I understand it well, to the need to create ecosystemic organizations, like uh, uh, organizations where multiple parties share uh, participation and, and compound, let's say, their uh, uh, missions together and build a more systemic mission together. So this is something that is happening in the business realm as well. So, for example, at Boundaries, we are now uh, experimenting a lot into uh, ways for uh, systems to coalesce and collaborate uh, uh, more easily. Uh, but the question that I have for you is more like, um, in this space, what is the role of uh, skin in the game? So the role of accountability, okay? Are you experiencing more like these uh, uh, key fab, uh, as uh, Alex uh, Komorowska would say, you know, this key fab where everybody participates into this dance, but then at the end of the day, nobody's responsible for the outcomes, right? Or it, there is a growing uh, way for uh, institutions on the field, maybe in the UNDP as well, to develop more accountability to and skin in the game on the outcomes. I, I don't know to what level this can happen because, of course, systemic transitions are very, as we said, it's very hard to define the right outcomes that you expect. But what is the process that you are seeing in terms of uh, these new institutional agreements uh, uh, emerging also being accountable to the results? When we started asking these questions around what are the conditions and capabilities that would help us start pursuing system transformation in a way that's more meaningful, um, one of the things that we quickly realized is this is equally about what are the types of interventions and policies and substance on the ground to tackle, say, changing climate, as it is about changing the rules of the game, as Julia pointed out. But then when it comes to changing those rules of the game, right? So for us as a development organization, we knew that in order to prove our relevance, we also had to prove that we are capable to have the skin in the game and, and, and experiment in areas that are traditionally much more difficult to innovate on because they hit at the core of power and money and, and that accountability. So there are a couple of things that I think stand out for me. One is I was really surprised as to the fact that m &E, so understanding change, understanding impact, being able to tell stories of intermediate change while we're pursuing a longer term thing seems to be a pain point across the board. So the m &E sandbox that we set up within a couple of months has grown to over 600 organizations. Everybody's on the quest of how do we actually collaboratively understand what is changing? What, what, what are the boundaries of the system? What we can and cannot do and what have you? Moving beyond ticking the box and counting things that we can count. So this has been one area that we hadn't really expected, but it has become a massive entry point to start having a conversation around the transformation. And, and this has brought in foundations donor governments as well as communities and, and, and largely cities on the city level, right? Because I think the public admin on a city level is much closer to community. So I think that's, that's one thing that we've kind of picked up on. And the other piece around, you know, your question around commitment to this, to the accountability and the results and what have you, it has taken some time, but at least nowadays we are at the stage where the organization is really willing to put its weight behind this change and start encoding some of these new, new changes. So we are at the cusp of getting a portfolio policy approved. You can be cheeky and say, well, policy is one, the way it's implemented is, is, is something else, but it's a massive signal from the organization that we want to come up with more options again to engage with our partners on this effort. We know that you know having a portfolio policy means we need to build a whole architecture and apparatus underneath it to support it. Again, hitting all of these questions around how do we finance, how do we work together internally, but also with others and what have you. And that has, to me, that's a big phase shift for us. Having that instrument, legal programming engagement instrument that now uh, allows more of a, I would say, credibility and legitimacy in terms of speaking about this transition, but also an instrument that we can start engaging and building more of an ecosystem around it. There's a couple of things, right? So one element of a skin in the game is imagine the reputational risk on going to a government, in our case, and 
saying you need to tackle climate change from a systemic perspective don't just reduce it to an environment issue it has many other speak etc and then they turn to you and say and what are you doing about it and you're still structured around the same thing right so there is one element of as we used to say eat your own dog food right in terms of actually literally showing that you are the first one who's actually going there and build credibility and in that sense also accountability by saying i at least i'm trying right the second question however and i think Milia alluded to simona which is really always to remember where the development sector comes from which is unfortunately power relations and we know better in the north and we tell you in the south what to do right and so in that logic moving you know, from the project to portfolio is also one way of saying that the accountability is actually becomes a delegation of power right which is incredibly difficult to do where a number of players own the problem because you know what the problem is systemic and expecting that one who holds a purse can actually tell everybody else to, to do is almost a recipe for disaster and so we just compare notes last week with uh, Climate Kick, who's working on this portfolio at a national level for Slovenia, moving into a circular economy, right? And one of the things we were reflecting upon is actually what are some of the elements that make this reciprocal accountability of a portfolio governance interesting, difficult, challenging, etc. But one of the things that I think is, is uh, really interesting, we go back to the theme that we were saying before, is that if you move to this portfolio logic, you actually go to people who are doing their work anyway in a particular area, say climate, need to go to any country, there will be hundreds of organizations already working on this. And then you use coherence as the leverage, right? You basically say, well, look, you can continue to do your own thing. If we are somehow able to elevate ourselves above our organizational identities and work in a portfolio logic, together yes we have a higher level of impact so a coherence attracts leverage that way and also we have a shared responsibility around the outcomes and the accountability now that is truly a very 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 different way of doing things and i think it's a big journey from where most of the development organizations are in terms of actually structuring yourself completely different in terms of being able to bring solutions that are adequate to the nature of a problem. So, so Julio inspired me to think about something else from the Slovenia case. One of the things that colleagues from the government said is that they've identified a lot of organizations doing interventions that are kind of short, like two, three years. They would start and they would end and that would be it. This coherence argument of a portfolio helped create a space where the work would leave legacy and others could come and build on it and sort of almost like engineering serendipity and making sure that the innovation that happened becomes irreversible, becomes baked into the movement that the portfolio comes sort of helps, helps usher. From my perspective, I haven't really thought about it that way, but for them, it has been a big reason for a number of these, you know, otherwise individual sort of interventions in organizations are kind of flocking to it and, 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 and taking the time to actually explore and find ways to engage with different parts of the, of the system. The question that I was, I was, was lingering in my, in my mind as you were explaining this is uh, uh, how do you build uh, uh, collective narratives around this? Because uh, it's very difficult to, to think about uh, setting an institutional renewal process and uh, dealing with this uncertainty and emergence if you don't have a, co a cohesive uh, narrative. Essentially, I, I think it's, gonna, it's, it's been challenging for you to move away from monolithic UNDP narrative and into kind of multiplying and get this plural process of building narratives contextually to the systems, if not the projects, to the systems you have been intervening into. So I, I was thinking about this uh, uh, narrative building, which is uh, another need, a capability that you have to develop as you move into portfolio. Similar to, you know, when you build a platform or an ecosystem initiative, you have to kind of create this uh, common win-win uh, perspective for, for all the parties to, to join. Yeah, so we talk a lot on that note, uh, Simone, one word we use a lot is intent, right? And how do you develop collaboratively a common intent, a North Star, if you want? which is, again, is quite different from a project world where you tend to talk about objective, right? And intent is quite different from objective. 
And it's something that is socially crafted as opposed to someone sitting and putting on a spreadsheet, we're going to achieve this by this time of a year, right? And so I think that is a big part of a challenge here is actually how do you hold that intent for a much bigger group of people that shared intent, maintain the North Star and the ability to adapt as circumstances change, but you continue to be drawn towards that particular North Star. So that's one of the big things, big shifts in terms of actually how to do it. But uh, there is a second piece to your dynamics, right? Because you're talking about how it actually works. And I think one of the interesting things that we discovered, uh, I guess, by doing is there is often a tendency when you talk about we need to move to systemic work, we need to move to a different way of doing things, etc., to assume tabula rasa. And therefore, the, the shift becomes really perceived as an enormous transition from what you're doing, right? It's all these big new things that you need to put in place, all these new partners you need to bring on board, all these new, new, new difficult big things that you need to do because systemic stuff is difficult, etc. One of the big things that we learned is that uh, it's actually extremely empowering, and this seems really ridiculous, but it is to work with what you have. So in fact, one of the first stages in the process we go through is to say you're working on climate and there's lots of people working on it, lots of different activities, as opposed to taking that as a problem, you're taking it as a major asset that you have. However, the piece that is missing is that again, all these parts are looking at themselves as individually, their identity is individualized. And so somehow you need to find a way to move them to a, a being comfortable to actually abstract and looking at all of themselves as part of a bigger series of patterns, the portfolio. But if you do that, what you realize is that you actually have plenty to work with to begin with. So the whole thing to shift to system, et cetera, seems so incredibly daunting. In reality, there is an awful lot already happening, except it lacks, again, coherence and a common intent, narrative, if you want to use your language. And once you start building the process, which of course takes time, and again, let me emphasize again in our experience, it's a social process, right? This is really about building trust infrastructure, relational infrastructure with a number of different partners once you if you get into that you actually can kickstart much faster because guess what out of this whole scattered activities now all of a sudden you can actually be much more purposeful in shaping them into working towards a particular north star uh, of mm -hmm. course it takes time it's difficult it challenges many different ways but that's really the path you embark on what we find is that it it takes courage and political capital for a mayor to actually take the time and create the space for that conversation that, that, that has a question of who are we as a city? What do we stand for? But then investing that time, as Julia pointed out, really allows for looking at what you have under a very different light. So we've had a couple of cases where governments sort of wanted to be future of work. It's all about digital and creative economy. This is where we need to go. We sort of help create a bit of a space to have this conversation about, well, what does that actually mean? And the end result in few cases was, well, future work is equally about digital and, and the future as it is about tackling the legacies of the past, the discrimination and what have you. And once you actually have that common frame, you actually start realizing that the government starts seeing that, you know, those bifurcated identities are standing in a way of putting together assets that they already have. So for example, one of the reasons why women are not volunteering for these incredibly uh, so, sort of well-crafted uh, schemes to become for part of formal economy is that they don't have childcare services and healthcare services are not on par and they end up spending a lot of time caring for the sick and elderly in their home. But if you actually look at work, not just from the perspective of, of future, but also from the perspective of what is hampering women to have more time, then you start co-locating your health services and your social inclusion services with your digitization and, and, and you kind of treat or, or, or sort of meet a particular person where they are and offer a full slew of services, if you will, that can solve the problem much better than when you were looking at it from the perspective of silos. 
Right, I mean, this resonates a lot with uh, some of the principles of our work that is uh, to ground the platform initiatives into the ecosystem mapping and scanning approaches. So when you said, you know, you have to start from what you have, basically, and, and map it and understand it and understand the lock-ins and, you know, don't just come imagine that you can generate uh, systemic outcomes as if uh, there was a tabula rasa, as Julio said. There's a lot of resonance with what we say. And, and, and I like to quote uh, Dave Snowden that once uh, on our podcast, if I'm not wrong, he said that you have to do to make uh, a resilience with the people you have. And I think that's a very important, uh, very important point, not just in the development space, but also, again, as a, as a reminder that when you enact platform strategies, you have to understand the ecosystems first and also extend your inquisitive work into systemic lock-ins that may be our f- common friend, the Indy would say, in the dark matter behind the scenes. I think what I wanted to understand more on, I know that, let's say, the systemic approach now has been you know, sort of implemented for a while now across different nations. You've taken a lot of projects underground. So I wanted to understand what has the uptake been on this how has the response from the ecosystem been has there been any uh, positive or negative sort of reflections that are coming in already and the other thing is like has let's say the portfolio approach equated to a systemic approach in that sense do these two equate to one another how has that sort of reflection been and all of this while of course like building capabilities on ground giving that power back to, let's say, the different stakeholders involved? It's a really good question, right? We've seen an uptick in energy when the likes of Mariana Mazzucato and Christian Basin and Climate KIC started talking about portfolio as a vehicle to pursue uh, mission-driven policy, right? But what we've also found is that portfolio practice and craft, if understood not just from the perspective of achieving efficiencies and internal coherence, but, you know, changing the rules of the game and, and, and tweaking what we do and how we do and power relationships is not necessarily well developed at this, at this stage. So I, I suppose the short answer is it, it's a hunch. This is the perspective from which we are pursuing it as a vehicle that can help. Uh, but there are a lot of different pieces that need to be coming together and that we need to be working on. And again, it's not a one organization mission. It's a, in, in our case of sector approach. One of the things that was interesting and we were very mindful of and still are is that portfolio doesn't become the new design thinking, meaning that is the one way to do systemic change, right? It just happens that in our particular context and because the history we just particularly described, right, it was the best shorthand we could find to signal a desire to work in a different way and a particular organizational journey of change. By far, we will never say, you know, this is the way to do things, and certainly not to do things like complex and systemic change. It's a frame that has helped us advance a particular journey of learning and change inside UNDP. And one of the things that has been interesting, as Millie said, is that uh, as we started going on this uh, journey, we figured out that there was an equal first for some of these aspects, not necessarily the whole portfolio approach always, but certain some elements of it, certainly this quest for coherence seems to be a common thread across the development sector. We search of what is next after, you know, a very still post-colonial type of approach. It's a useful catalyst for us in that sense, in terms of surfacing organizations that are asking the same questions and are on equally on a journey of discovery, what that actually means. In that sense, that has helped us open up conversations with organizations we might have not done otherwise. Did you see the emergence of a certain ontology, common ontologies and taxonomies as a result of your portfolio work. So, for example, a certain piece of intervention that can be taken from somewhere and replicated somewhere else or pieces that tend to compose itself themselves to compound into a more systemic strategy. So is composability and modularity a topic in this transition between uh, projects 
uh, that may be very vertical, may be very well integrated into portfolios where you create these options and modules. I mean, think of something similar to what happens with APIs or uh, single products or plugins or something like that in, in the work that you're doing. Are you seeing this composability and modularity emerge? It's a timely question because we've been turning what we are doing into a bit of a learning program for colleagues who have not drank the Kool-Aid on portfolios. And and, and we've had exactly this conversation, uh, Simone, and there may be three things that stand out, both internally, uh, but also when we look at organization outside UNDP who may not use the same words, but are actually using similar principles. And, and, and there are some things that kind of repeat. So three things. One, investment in seeing what's hidden and hearing what's not said. So understanding the system, which is a whole set of capabilities and processes that in a more kind of projectized world is assumed away, if you will. This is one. The second one is the ability to continually generate new options. Um, and this is where really these two worlds clash fundamentally, because even if we manage to get the ecosystem around working at the clock speed at which changes are happening on the ground, if the operational side of things, ability to procure, to hire, to contract, isn't on the same way, things grind, right? So the second one is being able to generate more options, both from the perspective of you know, having your finger on the pulse on, on what's going on, being able to extract learning, but also being able to do. And then the third aspect is reconfiguring relationships, reconfiguring relationships within the organization, reconfiguring relationships with partner with partners uh, uh, outside. So these three keep repeating. And now a couple of years into this process, we have started codifying some of this practice. And when we see uh, either colleagues from inside or organization outside pick up some of that and try to appropriate it and make sense of it, they also come back with these three things that really stand out to them as difference from a more kind of linear projectized approach to um, this other practice. We were very much inspired. In fact, our initial framework was taken from a Cora Foundation, which is an approach which is modular by design, right? It's designed to be modular that way, the way you describe it, Simone. What we found is that we needed to internalize it and appropriate it and then turn it into what Millie has eventually described. That's a journey that has taken us to do it. And now we have our, you know, our own modules, if you want to call it this way, which then starts, again, this interesting relation with other organizations that won't start asking about, okay, how do you do this or what are elements of doing this? And again, I think it's really interesting to, to reflect, right? So again, we saw a really lot of more questions around this space as soon as portfolio has been indicated by the EU and others as a way to deliver on missions. Then the whole mechanics of how this works, uh, is this something that is modular or not? What can be translated from one geography or another? All these questions become much more urgent in the sense that there is a big political agenda behind it in that particular space, right? But even with beyond the EU and with partners in the developing world, the same questions uh, come up again, as Milly said. I was thinking to maybe use a few minutes to move ahead and beyond the discussion of portfolios and uh, um, get your polls in terms of uh, um, what's happening, you know, in general in the world and uh, this tendency towards more uh, disintegrated systems and um, apparently much more polarization and local uh, initiatives being more important and, and so on. So this kind of, uh, we are talking about SDGs and uh, um, uh, SDGs kind of represent a global project like like if uh, this global project would exist but uh, if i look into the last maybe couple of years uh, it looks like the, the idea of a global consensus it's really fading right so uh, i'm curious to know what's your Im impression in terms of how the development uh, uh, world and the business world uh, are, and maybe you know uh, trying to have this conversation beyond sectors right so to think about uh, the, the connection between the private, the public, and the open systems. Uh, how are these uh, type of uh, agreements and, and activities uh, reconfiguring themselves uh, in a much more fragmented world? 
you of course play uh, or at least played inside a very iconic organization that is global by design let's say but what are your feelings in terms of how your work is shifting uh, going beyond sectors beyond borders and uh, maybe beyond the uh, pre-configured ideas of global development uh, uh, that we used to have and it's been maybe declined into more local or more uh, contextual ideas of development that uh, uh, maybe don't fit into the you know very well framed uh, albeit uh, sometimes uh, conflicting uh, structure of the SDG no, you can find a lot of critique of the SDG agenda. But I think from our perspective, what has been really useful is to see how different governments engage with SDGs and what are the different frames, you know, as an accelerator, as an integrator, as a business opportunity, as an alignment with the broader international agenda. So that has been really interesting because we've been able to see certain things filter out as commonalities across. And there may be five things that stand out for us across, right? One is uh, we're painfully seeing the limits of the current financial systems in so far that, for example, the levels of debt are severely constraining government's ability to invest in education and health and social care across the board, one. Two, focus on rethinking institutions. So this is where I think you've had a conversation with Jeff Mulgan and a lot of his recent work has been how do we, we have made progress in so many other areas, but our, but our institutions are really true remnants of the past, trying to sort of grapple and fight with problems that have way bypassed them, right? So we see a lot of countries actually looking into this question without necessarily having that social imagination that Jeff also talks about in terms of how do we, how do, we do that within the political realities of today. Three, cities and what it means to build livable, sustainable cities as a pattern across, across different regions, across different development contexts, resilient infrastructure from more kind of future-facing digital infrastructure, but also bricks and mortar, energy infrastructure, health infrastructure, road infrastructure. And last, the fifth one is work, the way that the concept of work is actually changing and morphing across. So I would say... SDGs is a kind of a global construct that's meant to represent that we all on this planet are kind of aiming toward an intent, if you will, of what type of a planet we want to live in. For us, this has been, it has generated conversations that seem to be filtering out some patterns across that seem to be on the minds of most countries that we're looking at. And, and I think this is where the value is because it allow us, it allows us to start kind of engaging and using that as a honey, if you will, to start bringing in ecosystems to start answering some of these questions more, more, more effectively. Yeah, and I would only add, in a sense, the situation you described, Simon. So on one hand, I think it's important we all remind ourselves this is a matter of choices, right? So this, uh, uh, you know, decoupling, <laughs> fragmentation, etc., is something that governments, institutions, citizens, whatever you choose. And so, you know, it's important to remind that if we still believe in, in global values, in global priorities, etc., it's a matter of figuring out a way to make it happen, right? So that remains the same thing. And then, interestingly, if you accept that there is increasing fragmentation and etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that actually makes the call for Portfolio approaches meaning as approaches that actually bring coherence to a lot of activities distributed across different sectors, different players, etc. Even more, right? So I think you talked also to Dan Hill, or anyway, so he likes this, the phrase of small pieces loosely joined, right? Uh, and, and being able somewhat to bring these things together and figuring out the way again to craft a common intent from very disparate players and, and being able to hold that as bigger constructs seems to be questioned. I think that becomes even, even more important. So, in that sense, I think that makes the whole logic of, of this bringing together and creating uh, commonality under a shared intent even more important and timely as, as an organizational capability. I really resonate uh, uh, with this, uh, and especially um, the, the message I get, you know, the, the impression I get is that uh, 
uh, on one side you are you're bringing you're trying to bring coherence on the other side you are accepting the dy dynamic transformations so it's like uh, you, you're not bringing coherence because you want to control but it's in, rather since you are accepting that things are much more dynamic and distributed then you have uh, uh, a need for you know enacting coherence at some level which reminds me on another conversation that uh, we had uh, uh, on this podcast with Rita McGrath. It was 2020, if I'm not wrong, or 21. I don't remember when she said, you know, she was making the point that we had to move from control to coherence as a way to deal with uh, much more uncertainty uh, in the system. So, so I think that's very resonating and our listeners can catch up with that uh, old episode that we will put into the notes. When you said about small pieces loosely joined, right? I was thinking about my own reflection of how I have let's say strong opinions loosely held and sort of practicing that day in and out. So it was nice to hear that as well. And yeah, I mean, the conversation was really interesting to have both of you. What I wanted to ask was if you all have maybe any breadcrumbs or suggestions um, to share for our audience, any books or podcasts, any, any piece of information that has helped you that can help our audience as well. It'll be good to share. What I'm currently reading is Sasha Hesselmeyer's Slow Lane who talks about sort of moving at the speed of trust and, and, and sort of resisting the allure of quick silver bullet solutions um, and building a space for a very different type of uh, relationships and approach to some of these complex systems. It's a, it, it's a fantastic book and it's very well researched with a lot of examples from um, various different contexts that has been incredibly helpful. Yeah, and I would mention uh, a TED talk by Kirsten Dunlop, which is illustrating the way that uh, Climate Kick applies a portfolio approach to the climate issue uh, that has been herself and the organization has inspired quite a lot of our work and that that talk captures it quite nicely. Thank you so much. So we are uh, uh, at the end of the conversation. So Shruti, uh, it was a pleasure to have your, your questions as always, your participation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks both of you for joining in as well. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, thank you both. I hope you enjoyed the conversation a bit at least. <laughs> thank you very much. It was fantastic. Thank you Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. And uh, for our listeners, as always, uh, you will find all the information on this podcast on our uh, webpage, boundless.io slash resources slash podcast, where you will find the episode. And uh, uh, in the episode, uh, you will find the transcript and all the show notes, so the references, the breadcrumbs and, and all. And uh, um, I hope you enjoyed the, the episode as well. Uh, and until we speak again, uh, remember to think boundaryless. <laughs>